Now, let's start with studying the left ventricular systolic function by 2D echo. Another way to obtain volumes of the left ventricle to analyze the, the ejection fraction is the area length method. It came from the heart catheterization lab as a method to study the size of the left ventricle using ventriculograms. It measures the area of the left ventricle and its length. It stands to reason that if you use not only one single short X diameter, as in tight holes, but the area of the left ventricle cavity and its length, it should be more accurate. Then how do we do it? We may take only an apical four chamber or also an orthogonal view, like an apical two chamber. We measure the left ventricle volume during diastole and systole by planimetry of the left ventricular endocardial borders and the length of the mitral annulus to the apex. And then use this equation here. Don't worry, the echo apparatus gives it automatically. Here we have an apical four chamber during diastole and another uh, during systole. The diastolic moment will be the one selected frame by frame as the largest left ventricle and the systolic the smallest one of the same cycle. Most of the echoes apparatus asks to start the planimetry by the septal basal endocardial board. Do it till the lateral edge close to the mitral annulus. Then you just push a button and the two limits of the planimetry will join at the annulus plane and will give you a line positioned as left ventricular length for you to accept it or adjust it. Don't finish the planimetry by reaching where you started it. The planimetry line should be at the, the endocardial border of the wall. The papillary muscle and all visible trabeculations should not be included by the line. Essential to avoid any foreshortening of the left ventricle. Then, by doing during diastole and systole, we obtain the diastolic, systolic and ejection volume plus the ejection fraction. Another method very much used is the modified Simpsons, also called the DISCS method. It may be the method with better concordance with values of uh, ejection fraction by cardiac MRI. However, there is a more considerable difficulty in doing it and a significant inter and intra observer variation. For sure, much higher than reported in the literature. How does it work? It divides the left ventricle into several discs or cylinder with known diameter of its base and height. Since the volume of each disc equals pi times the squared radius of the base times the height, the volume of each cylinder will be known. Then, the volume of the left ventricle equals the sum of all the cylinders inside its cavity, measured in diastole and systole. Here it is. We start the planimetry of the left ventricular area as we did for the area length method before, and then to measure the length of the cavity. Once this is performed, the cavity is divided in several discs by the cavity length. As you see, each cylinder will have a known base diameter, the distance from one side to the other of the planimetry, and height being the length of the cavity by the numbers of discs. Notice also that you may use Simpson's rule even when the ventricle does not have a known geometry shape, since it does not use a geometric formula to get the volume. 
like in this case, for instance, where there is an aneurysm in the apex. No problem, the discs will be more extensive there, and the added extra volume will be considered. In a way, it is the better method to obtain a, a volume and the ejection fraction. But there are some serious problems. In a four chambers view, before starting the planimetry, we must carefully be sure the left ventricle is not far shortened. Difficult is to know exactly where are the endocardial wall borders, since when one stops the frames and there is no movement, the identification of these boundaries is terrifically hampered. Mainly the lateral wall in the fore and the anterior wall in two chambers. Don't include the papillary muscle and fabrications in your planimetry. Look in the case how the papillary muscle and all these trabeculations in the apex are not included. Same patient. Note the slight modification with less foreshortening of the left ventricle. A slight modification in position but an enormous alteration in volumes and ejection fraction. An ejection fraction from 46 to 63 percent. Same patient, same day, same hour, same minute. Some problems. My impression is that any actual echo method, even 3D, as we will see in future lectures, is not accurate to measure ejection fraction. I instead feel much more comfortable feeling that I am given a more reliable information to the attending physician if I report to him my eyeball impression. If you say, okay, however, you need years of experience to evaluate the ejection fraction by eyeball, I would respond, if you are so far in this series of a lecture, I'm sure that you can differentiate a normal, moderate, and important left ventricular dysfunction by eyeball. That is what is important for clinical decision. You do not have to eyeball the actual value of an ejection fraction. I'm sure I'm not able to do this. This is very difficult. And what is the golden standard to compare? However, you may say, but they need a number. I would respond, no, they do not. They need help to decide. Numbers are significant for the study using populations. But we do not study populations, but a single patient. And we must be careful to extrapolate the results of some papers based in correlations when what we need is concordance when studying this patient that I'm doing, for instance, now. Then you say, but a measurement is an objective way to evaluate and the eyeball is subjective. I would answer, there is no objective measurement in echocardiography. All the procedures to achieve the measurement, like correct transducer position, better settings of the apparatus for diminishing artifacts and improving resolution, where to set your cursor to measure, decide what is endocardial wall or trabeculation, and so on, they are all subjective. I defy anyone to tell me it's a single totally objective measurement in echocardiography, M-mode, 2D, Doppler, TEE, 3D, speckle tracking, or whatever. Then, since the echo world relies heavily on numbers, what do I do in my reports? I give the values if they agree with the eyeball. If they do not, I repeat them several times until I get a concordant number or change the evaluating method from Tychos to Ireland to Simpson. If it's still not concordant, 
Then I write a report saying that the number was such, but my visual impression is not that. And then I write what I think and add. It is necessary clinical correlation. Let me take Simpsons as an example. It is used to obtain the volume of a three-dimensional structure that has no perfect geometric Euclidean figure, where you can use a simple equation. Like this vase, for instance. It is not a ball or a cube or a cone or anything that you can use Euclidean geometry. Furthermore, I can delineate its border and the planimetry I make will be undoubtedly perfect. A planimetry area will be the same if obtained using any side of the vase. There is no problem with lateral resolution since I'm using light instead of ultrasound. Then Simpsons would be perfect. However, you do not find an LV like this. Watch what that left ventricular wall is. This is a left ventricular wall that you must planimetry. Where is the exact endocardial border? Will it be possible to define by ultrasound resolution? Moreover, even if I could, what is representative of the endocardium? Maybe this bottom line here, or here at the top. However, since due to the ultrasound beam resolution, all this will be enlarged in the direction of the cavity, depending on its distance from the transducer and gain the measure endocardium, or where you will set your planimetry, will be somewhere around here. Then you will have a number that correlates but not represent the reality. Maybe close to it or far away from it, but you do not know which. In this situation, it may be better to use a single diameter. For instance, pay attention to this case. We see here a hypertrophied left ventricle. The walls in this parasternal lung X are well recognized and a reasonable perpendicular and mode to the lung X may be obtained. What if I use here ellipsoid or tight Take a single diastolic and systolic diameter measurement and get an ejection fraction. I know it's not going to be accurate due to the necessary assumptions of the method. It may over-evaluate the ejection fraction. But I'm pretty much sure that if I have to repeat the exam days from now or a few hours from now, I may obtain values similar to those obtained initially. Moreover, what happens if I use a Simpson? Then it may get complicated. Look here. Where is the endocardial border of the wall? It is very subjective. Many will line the endocardium as being here. However, we have seen there is a hypertrophy and the wall is thickened and here it's not. For sure there is endocardium here in front. However, where is it? Let's zoom in on that wall. The endocardial border seems to be this one. However, it cannot be. It is the epicardium pericardium being enlarged and well defined by its proximity of the lung. Solid air interface increases a lot the lateral size of any structure. Let's raise a lot the local gain and uh, we now see the endocardial border. However, even with more gain, I do not visualize the walls correctly. Look at the apex. The endocardium is somewhere inside here, but I, I do not know where. The endocardium usually is, is a good reflector, and thus it functions as a mirror. The ultrasound that hits here 
will be reflected down, not back to the transducer. We are not sure in most adult patients where is the endocardial border. Having less geometric assumptions and by pure reasoning, does the Simpson method seem to be more accurate and just the ones that use only a short X? Sure, it does. The problem is that it will have an inter and intra observer variation too significant to be clinically useful. If you repeat this patient's few hours or days later, indeed the difference may be substantial. When you are using a single short X diameter, it surely is not accurate than a correct obtained Simpsons, but it may be much more reproducible. See this patient with two measurements performed days apart. The diameter values are pretty much the same. The ejection fraction seems to be over-evaluated, but its reproducibility is obvious.